Have you ever struggled to figure out how to start a project, how to see it through to keep all the pieces together in your mind? Or maybe you're just trying to figure out the best way to strategize for your business. Well, I'm here today to talk to you about a mind map and how it can help you strategize your business. Welcome to the Prof Sales YouTube channel. I am Prof Sales. And on this channel, we talk about being in business for yourself, being an entrepreneur, selling on e-commerce platforms like eBay, Amazon, and maintaining a positive community here in our little niche of the internet, our little part of YouTube. And we are glad that you're here. It's a live show. So if you ever wanna join us, we're on at two o'clock, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Eastern Standard Time for the most part. And you can join the live chat. You can leave me a question or say a question in the chat if you would like, and I'll definitely do my best to answer it. But if you're catching this video after it's already posted, go ahead and leave a question or a comment. I'd love to hear from you and just kind of see your where you're at with your business and your mind and your mapping, as we will talk about here in a minute. So <clears throat> we're letting the room fill up a little bit here, but I'm excited to talk about this topic. I've been thinking about this topic for several weeks now, and it's something that I've been using and developing for my business. I'm gonna share with you guys the mind map we are using right now to kind of strategize the e-commerce part of our business here in a few moments. But I thought it would be important to talk to you guys. Some of you guys may have heard this term, a mind map before. Some of you may not have heard of it before, but I just wanted to take a moment to sort of talk about what it is and you know, you know know how it can help you. And, and yes, some of you were already pointing out, Karin is not here today. Um, she is actually at another, she's actually at a, a, a job, believe it or not. She's working a, a part-time gig, something she really enjoys doing, and she's there today. Hopefully she's listening, but I don't know if she's or not. But she is not here, but the hand thing is here. That's an inside channel joke for those of you who are new. Don't worry about it. You'll figure it out as we go. It's the thing. Um, but I want to talk to you first about what a mind map is because it's always important. I mean, I, I never want to assume that somebody knows what it is. It's something I've been introduced to over the past few years. And basically, it's a way of seeing visually the connections between components that might be a project, your business, a subject, anything like that. So if you think about, <clears throat> excuse me, I just sneezed right before we came on the air. If you think about how we, um, how we visualize, say, a project, you know, like you've got all these pieces. Maybe you've got, it's got this part that has to be done, and it's got this part, and this part, and this part, and this part, and they've all got pieces that, those pieces have more pieces and more pieces, and it sort of expands out. And there's, it's very hard to sort of think about doing all those things as a list. Now I know everybody, you know, likes the idea of list or maybe doesn't like the idea, but you're at least familiar with the idea like, all right, um, I've got this project and it involves, you know, 74 steps. <laughs> and it can be kind of overwhelming to sort of list all those and think, all right, now I gotta do number one, number two, number three, but wait, I did number four and now I'm not sure how that's gonna impact number 16. So it can be difficult to do things sometimes in a sequential list. And our mind really doesn't work that way. Um, <clears throat> often our mind sees it as a big total um, visual picture. I like to think of a cloud and a cloud has these different components. And when you put all the components together into a cloud, you know, in the right proportions, it rains, you get a result. But our, our brain sometimes, you know, is smarter than our, um, what we can put down on paper. So that's where a mind map comes in. It allows you to, um, excuse me, it allows you to, to see things in not such a linear fashion. Um, you know, we tend to make all these connections all at once and we see them as sort of these sets of clouds rather than just one or two items, but it's hard to put that on paper. And I think that's why, um, you know, a mind map is so useful to sort of look at that because now you can see it all visually. So what is this really good for this idea of like seeing everything together in one big, um, one big mind map. Um, it allows you to see all the parts at once and that can be tricky to do to see that like you can see them on paper or on your computer screen. Um, it allows you to identify 
logical connections. That can be difficult because when you're planning your business, for instance, um, it can be difficult to see like, all right, this part of it is connected to this part of it. Or you just forget, you know, I mean, we have, we're all busy. We have a lot of things going on. It can be difficult to see that um, uh, I want to run a more profitable business this year. Great. Don't we all? Um, paying less for shipping is part of that. Oh, that's great. I understand that's part of it too. Well, having a scale and um, reducing my time at the post office and cutting down on shipping errors will help you. Sometimes it's hard to see that having a scale helps your business be more profitable, but it really does. So that a mind map can help you with that. Um, number three, uh, streamline your processes. Like a lot of us have these processes for how we do things, but sometimes it's hard to see them all in the, the full picture all at once. And, you know, maybe, maybe you see that um, having a shipping station right next to your shipping supplies makes sense when you see it down in, you know, on paper that you can see that, all right, rather than walking all the way across the room or to another room, it makes sense to put all these things together. And I usually uh, print off my stuff to ship in the morning near my computer, which I set right here. So maybe it makes sense to have my shipping station here. Uh, clarify your thoughts into a cohesive approach. This is really one that, you know, I always struggle with because if you're like me, and I suspect some of you are, sorry. But if you're like me, um, <clears throat> it's hard sometimes to kind of think about it. You kind of go off in different directions, right? We chase shiny objects. And it's hard to kind of keep it all cohesive and remember, all right, this is all going towards a specific overarching objective. And it can be hard to see that cohesively because you get caught up in the minutia of the day-to-day -day and you get caught up into you know this process or that process that will help you um see obstacles and plan for them this is a big one too you know often in my business i have run into things that i didn't even know they were an obstacle until i started doing something over here that caused the obstacle to appear over here and a lot of times I think if I would have had a better overall, you know, visualization of the process, I probably could have figured out that was going to be an obstacle. Like, for instance, um, you know, the obstacle of having my inventory in separate rooms in the house that we were in made us less efficient. It made us less efficient when we had to pull something. It made us less efficient when we had to put something away. Um and it made it less efficient when we had to do an inventory, all those things. So um, all those things are good examples of how like a mind map can help you see all these things. So I'm going to show you one right now because I think it's a lot better to see it than um, just to talk about it, obviously. So I'm going to show you an app that I have called, this is called Simple Mind. And Simple Mind is a free app. As far as I know, it's free. Um, let me get this to sc scale down here a little bit so I can still see you guys. And I think you can go to simplemind.eu. Uh, simplemind and you can check this out for yourself. So here we go. So this is the app and it looks like this and kind of looks like this big drawing space. And it looks more intimidating than it really is. It's because it's really not that intimidating. But um, basically what it allows you to do is go in and create basically just like an overarching theme. Like mine, I made financial growth, all right? And I put a cool little photo in here. You can do that. You can add your own images, whatever you want. And then once you have that, you're gonna expand out from it. And this is where it gets really cool. So watch this. Ta-da! we see all these different things that I think will be part of financial growth going forward. <clears throat> and you can see, I have all these little, um, you know, sort of little tendrils going out from them. So how do you do that? Well, you see this little plus right here in the middle. If I click plus, I can add another one. So like I'll put test right there. And I have a new one now called test. And I can do things with that, which we'll get into. But I'm gonna get rid of that one. 
And you can see I have like investing, e-commerce platforms, consignment, YouTube, eliminating debt, marketing, print on demand, all kinds of things we're talking about is our strategy. And you can scroll around in this. And I'm going to scroll. I'm going to move it down here so we can see it a little better. You can see I have here one called e-commerce platform. So I'm going to open that up. And now you see you have eBay sales and Amazon sales. So now I can look at this and see, all right, my e-commerce platform strategy right now is involving eBay and Amazon. Let's say, as I just signed up for, you want to add Poshmark. So now I've added Poshmark to this. Now I don't have anything else with Poshmark yet because I don't know what my strategy is going to be on Poshmark yet. I'm looking at duplicating listings that I have on eBay. Uh, maybe I'll do specific listings. I know nothing about the platform, so I am still learning. Um, uh, so hopefully you got, let me know if you guys can see okay here. Uh, yeah, it sounds, looks like everybody can see okay. All right. So now that, that allows you to just kind of keep adding things. So if I wanted to add another one and say, uh, oh, that's the wrong thing. If I wanted to add, say, you know, Etsy, I could add that out here. And I could just keep going like this literally forever. So I'm going to get rid of Etsy because I'm not planning on selling Etsy. All right. So let's drill down a little further. You see here there's a little arrow here. And by the way, each of these has some other options too. For instance, I can click on this T here. It might be kind of hard to see, but that opens up a note box. So you could go in here and put very specific notes about anything you want. And they have some style, you know, customization you can do too. But I could go in here and type notes. And then when I click on this, I'll be able to see that there are notes. Um, but let's go ahead and open this up even further. And you see that a strategy popped up. Hmm. Well, so I might have a strategy here for eBay and you can see here that I created some strategies here. So here's some of my strategy for eBay going forward. Listing five days a week. I'm going to zoom in a little so you guys can see us a little better probably. Um, listing five days a week, finishing current listings that I have and maintaining a 500 listing um, at least uh, total off of this. Raising my average selling price to 50 bucks an item and sourcing new items. So that's kind of my overarching strategy for eBay um, going forward. And this allows me to just see it all in one place. I can decide, does that really make sense? Can I really list five days a week? Do I need to list seven days a week? Could it be three? How am I going to raise my average selling price to $50 an item? Well, that might include doing some other stuff. So, and what's, and when I broke this sourcing new items out, already even further and I'm still working on all this but I'm going to show you what that looks like so now you can see sourcing new items well some of those items will be shoes and toys well where will I get those from Burlington Marshalls TJ Maxx and Ross stores which I have a lot of those stores around me so now I can look at I'm going to zoom out a little bit I can look at my entire eBay strategy at all at the same time and see what I'm doing with eBay. Very, very simply. And all I did is just kept building levels here, guys. Um, and just, and you, as I said, you can put notes on any of these you want, say, you know, whatever you want to put on them, actually. Oh, raise average selling price to $50. All right, well, let me write some notes about that. What does that look like? And I kind of started doing the same thing for Amazon. It has a strategy. And you can see that Amazon looks something like this. Um, so I will go with a maybe an online arbitrage strategy, which I will consider courses in that and doing research on that because I don't know anything about it. Um, shoe listings potentially on Amazon because I am sourcing some new shoes. I'm sourcing some new shoes over here for eBay that might do better on Amazon. So that those two things actually could kind of be connected together. I want to source uh, up higher. That's supposed to be like higher selling price items and new items. And here's some categories I'm considering, toys, automotive, home improvement, and some of the stores that I could hit with all those. Some of those even overlap, like Walmart Automotive sometimes can, you can find deals, toys in Walmart. Um, and then some goals here. I had 100 listings by end of May. And then a net margin of 30% because Amazon margins are lower traditionally than pre-owned items on eBay. So it's going to be a little lower, but you move more volume. So now I'm going to scroll back out. And now you guys can see, I can see my entire e-commerce platform strategy here for eBay and Amazon all in one spot. And I can kind of look at those visually and say, huh, 
did those really make sense? Do they, and by the way, you can move these around. Like, so like if I want to put this here, I can move, there's a way to probably move all these at once when you move one, but I'm not really exactly sure how to do that yet. But you can see I can put them a little more closer together if I want. I mean, these can go like anywhere you want. Um, so you don't, you're not stuck with like a specific type of um, structure here. And it has all kinds of cool structures you can do. Like if you, if I click on this, you can see like I can change the colors. Like uh, there's, uh, that's supposed to be uh, bright colors. I don't really think that's that bright. There's soft colors, uh, soft colors left and right. And kind of changes some of the things about this. Um, I think I'm at spring levels. Uh, let's see, which one did I use? I may have changed it. I don't even know. Yep. Oh, I did this one. Test. Okay. So that's the levels I have right now. And I kind of like these colors. I like that they kind of keep branching out. And you can just kind of make them see branches like strategy went out from eBay and Amazon. And then the next levels were green, which is kind of cool because they're all kind of on the same sort of level. Um, but this is how it works, guys. And you could do this with any particular subject. And you could even take eBay and make it its own subject over here, its own mind map, and map it out if you wanted. Just make it very specific to eBay. Um, you can do this with projects. You can do this with homework. <laughs> you can do it really with anything. You could do this with like your goals, maybe your personal goals, like you have a weight loss goal or a fitness goal, a dietary goal. You have a goal to keep learning things, all kinds of things. And it's really super cool. Um, I was going to try to show you. I don't think I have a note on any of these, but um, the notes are kind of helpful because you can, you know, you can go into to more and more of those. So like I'll show you like investing, um, you know, some things I consider with investing peer-to-peer -peer lending, stocks, and real estate. And from those, I might need to branch out more and say, well, peer-to-peer, -peer, what are some of my options? Like LendingTree is a big peer-to-peer -peer site where you can actually go in and be part of it. There's some other ones out there too. Um, but I don't know a lot about those things, so I'm not quite there yet, but I'm still kind of growing it. And it's really a cool tool to, um, to let you see everything you're kind of doing at once um, without like having to make a big long list and you can see what the connections are and the similarities. As I mentioned, you know, I'll be able to source, you know, Walmart for both of these things, toys and automotive. Um, you know, shoes are something I'll probably be selling on both platforms. So there'll be times that it might work better on Amazon. It might work better on eBay, just depending on what the item is. So that's, that's a natural link right there. So I have some you know, efficiencies there with shoes because they can go in either direction. You know, raising my average selling price to $50 on eBay helps Amazon listings too because the net margin tends to be lower there. So if I'm raising my average selling price, I'm again, I'm giving myself the best chance to sell on either one of these. And Poshmark probably will be the same. I'm just not sure yet. Um, all right, so I'm going to come back. Uh, hopefully that was not too painful. Um, uh, and you guys can see that. Um, uh, sorry if I missed any comments here. I'm probably, and by the way, there's a lot of mind map apps out there. I always like an app because if I, because uh, Beth says she does it on paper, which I understand, but on paper, I would actually make so many mistakes, Beth, that it would actually be slower <laughs> than doing it on an app. I think, and plus I think an app gives you a lot more options. It's easier to move stuff around. You don't have to race anything. Um, but I, maybe I'm just not expert enough at mind maps. Um, so yeah, so mind map for your business guys, if you haven't tried one, um, just even like a simple little project or something, it's really easy. There's a cool book down in the um, description of this video that you can, there's a link to it. It's like one of the first few links and you can check it out about mind mapping, but you don't even need the book. Honestly, you could also just go and, and get started and try and kind of see, there's not like a right or wrong one. There's lots of great videos out there about mind maps. Um, but anyway, uh, let's see. Uh, I'm going to go through some of the comments here. Uh, Thomas says, sorry, but for me, that's not a strategy, more a task plan. Could I ask what is the meaning behind the word strategy? Well, the meaning, I mean, if you think about a strategy, Thomas, this is the way I think about a strategy. I, I'm probably saying your name wrong. It looks like it's Tomas. If you think about a strategy, what is a strategy? It's an overall plan to do something, right? But that plan is made up of specific, I like to think of them as tactics, you know? And so maybe your tactics are, I think like the bubbles I just showed you on the mind map. All right, I have a strategy to grow my Amazon business. Well, what tactics will I use 
to grow that business? Well, it'll be things like sourcing shoes. It'll be things like sourcing um, toys and uh, replenishables, things that I could find. And where, where will I find them at? Well, I'll find them at Marshall's or TJ Maxx or Ross store or Burlington. So I look at it that way, like there's strategy and then the strategy is made up of specific tactics. And I think a mind map gives you a great way to do both. That's just kind of the way I look at it. Um, but um, you're, you're free to have your own interpretation of what a strategy is versus, uh, um, you know, tactics and tasks and so on. Um, Krillin, thank you so much for the super chat. He says, prof, don't give up on the bins. A lot of profit there. Oh, man, the bins video. Um, yeah, we just did a video about um, why new sellers especially shouldn't source at the bins to get started selling on eBay. And um, I've got a lot of comments about it. A lot of uh, a lot of likes, a lot of dislikes. You know, um, I guess I expected that to some degree. I think any time that you come on, you know, YouTube, Facebook, what whatever, pick your platform, pick your poison, and you tell people that the way they're doing something doesn't make the best sense. It's not the best business strategy. <laughs> There's that word again, Tomas. Um, I think it's going to ruffle some feathers. It's going to make some people upset. They're not going to like that, you know, that they th they're going to defend their position, which they should. You should be able to defend your position. If you can't defend your business model against a critique, then it's really probably not your model. It's someone else's model that you just think is a good one because you heard it somewhere. You need to be able to defend your position. You need to be able to defend your business model and the way you're going. And I have changed my model in, on more than one occasion because I reached a point where I felt like this is not working for me. I don't want to go in this direction anymore. It doesn't make sense. That's not failure. That's actually progress. Failure is staying in a failed model for year after year, month after month, year after year, and not getting the results you really want and just refusing to change because you're stubborn. That would be failure in my book. But lots of people think it's failure if you ever change your mind and change direction. That's just silly. I mean, the history of business is written with all these successful stories. And in every case, the people who were massively successful pivoted and changed course multiple times over their careers for all kinds of reasons. I mean, that's just the way it goes. The market changes, your situation changes, everything changes. So. But I appreciate the super chat, Rob, and we will definitely talk. <laughs> uh, let's see. Do you mind map Karin? No. <laughs> Ed says, I always lose the paper. Um, yeah, I, that, another reason to like an app. I mean, technology is great, isn't it? I mean, why not use it if you can? I don't look at it as a learning curve. I mean, there is a learning curve with technology. I look at it as a time saver and efficiency builder on the back end because it usually does. Um, I mean, there's limits, obviously, you know, um, but I think we would argue using computers and things like that can make you more efficient. Learning how to program a computer is very time consuming and might take you longer than it's really worth. So there's a level you stop there. But I think, you know, things like an app to do something like a mind map are, that's a great thing for an app to do. I, in my opinion, like it's right in the wheelhouse. That particular app you can download on Map Mobile, um, Simple Mind. But there's so many of these you can use. That's not the only one. Pick one that you think works for you. A lot of them are free. Some of them are not free. Some have a paid version. Um, I don't. I don't get anything from them by recommending Simple Mind. So if you want to check that one out, it's not because I. I'm getting anything from them. Um, I saw it was a cool one. But there's lots of other good ones out there. What was the address again? The address of what? Uh, simplemind.eu, if that's what you're talking about for the uh, mind map um, software. Uh, there's like a mobile version and a desktop version. That was a desktop version I showed you because I couldn't figure out how to easily show you the mobile version as a screen share. So that's why I did it that way. Uh, some people uh, use a dream book planner, which uses mind maps. Yeah, very similar. Again, I'm just not a paper guy anymore. I mean, I like to see things on paper, but I hate writing down on paper, typing on paper anymore because it just I make so many mistakes. I guess that's my problem, right? Um, uh, the shoe rack behind you holds 50 pair of shoes. Glenn asks, what's up, Swamp? Haven't talked to you in a while. Um, it does. It holds 50 pair of shoes with no box. Um, I would recommend if you have boots, for instance, 
it's probably not going to hold 50 because as you can see, you could put them on the top rack, but if they were taller, you probably, you might have to lay them down to put them in the racks below. So it's not going to hold 50 pair of boots. It'll hold about 40 pair that are in boxes roughly. Um, just depending on the box sizes, obviously, but it's a song mix shoe rack. There is a link to it down below an affiliate link. It's a great little rack. Um, we have, uh, four of them. We have four of them in here. Actually, we have five of them. There's a fifth one over there, but they're a great little rack. They're really lightweight. <clears throat> they're easy to put together. They don't require any tools. You can put them together about 15 or 20 minutes. And, um, we just like them. They're, I don't know, just a nice little, nice little rack for shoes. You look like a ventriloquist. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, that's Karin's thingy there. Um, I guess officially now the name is thingy. I don't even know. So thank you guys for coming out today. 75 people really appreciate that. Um, the only thing I'm going to ask you to do is to hit the like button. If you're enjoying this content, even if you're not enjoying it, I guess you could hit the dislike button. That's all right, too. Here's a little secret of YouTube that YouTube doesn't want or a lot of people don't understand. Even when you hit the dislike button, it still helps your favorite YouTuber or your not-so-favorite YouTuber. Google just likes to see that people are watching, even if they don't like what they're seeing. <laughs> so, um, but whatever whatever floats your boat, I don't take it personal. Um, I have had a lot of comments about the Ben's video, guys, that we did, <clears throat> as I mentioned. And as I mentioned before, you know, always be able to, to defend your position. I'm a big advocate of that. You know, when I was teaching, I used to tell my students, I don't care what you think, just know why you think it. Be able to defend it. Don't don't just think something because, you know, your, your parents told you or your friends told you, whoever. But um, there are people who, I, I was talking with another reseller today and I said, you know, I don't get where, where people, you know, like, I, I, and I was talking about another reseller's bins model that when I did the math on it, and I might go into this in more detail because um, down the road, when I did the math on their model with their sales, like their sales on eBay over the past three months, <laughs> this is going to sound awful. And Rob, maybe you can chime in on this. So this is what I did. I looked at their past three months of sales and they had hundreds of solds, which was great. But I looked kind of in the middle. I looked in the middle of their solds and got their average selling price. And their average selling price was approximately $10. Um, and they had a few larger outlier sales at the, the highest price items they sold, but they had a lot of lower price items too. They sold for like two, three, four, five bucks. But their average right in the middle of their, their solds was about $10 plus shipping. And so they were charging shipping, which is, which is fine. So they're charging shipping and of course they're getting a discounted rate because they're top rated and they have a store and all that good stuff. Um, so they, when I did the math and, and they're a Ben strategy person, when I did the math on their model and I put it in my cal my sales calculator and so on and figured out, all right, let's just assume a $1 cost. Let's, you know, let's say they sold at this $10 plus shipping and their shipping cost was this. They were netting about $6.30 per item. Um, I also included uh, a $1 um, overhead cost because you have overhead, so it was like 10% of their selling cost, which or of their selling price, which is probably about right. So here's where it got interesting though. So they were netting $6.30 something cents of an item. But if you did the math on how many they were sold, they were selling, and you multiply that over the course of a year, and you figured out what kind of their their hourly rate was and what they would owe in taxes, I figured a twenty five percent tax bracket because if you're self employed, you're paying you know the self employment taxes plus you know income taxes. I figured a twenty five percent employment uh, tax burden, which I don't think is a, a, a crazy estimate. Guys, here's reality. And this particular person with this particular model, if they were making netting $6.36 an item based on their current sell-through over the past three months, 
if they're working 40 hours a week, it's an $8.19 per hour job. That was it. That's all it came out to be. Um, it came out to be if they were working 40 hours a week in their business, and I suspect they probably are, then they were netting after taxes and after expenses and everything about $8.20 an hour. I mean, that's the equivalent of probably about $11 an hour job maybe before taxes, um, somewhere in that range, maybe 12. So, I look, I'm not here to say that that's right or wrong. And I, you know, my, my numbers obviously have some fudge factor there. It could be a little above or below that. I don't think I'm far off because I did take solds. I took actual solds and figured out kind of where the mid, the, the median range is. And there was a lot in that range, right around a $10 selling price plus shipping. Um, and I'm not here to say that that's, you shouldn't necessarily do that. I'm just saying, as my other reseller friend who kind of checked my math said, that's a lot of work for not a lot of bang for your buck because you need to move hundreds of listings a month to do that. Um, so I don't know that every haul, every bins person is doing it that way, but this person has been doing it for a while. And I suspect their model is not that unusual for a lot of people who do that model. The problem is, is yes, you will find those home runs, but you just won't find enough of them um, very often to offset all of the sort of not even base hits. They're more like foul balls <laughs> that you're hitting because they're just not worth that much. Um, and you have to put your time and energy into it to equal all that and get it back out. Again, if you want to go that route and for that amount of money, that is totally up to you. I just think that it's, I think there's a better way to do it. Um, you know, jeans was higher than that number. It was, I mean, it was higher. I don't know if it was significantly higher, but it was higher for sure. But I, even there, I realized like to scale this would be so hard. I would have to put a lot of energy into it. Um, you know, it just didn't make sense to me. It just didn't make sense to me. So, um, sorry, uh, I, that was a long explanation. But I, I don't. Sus I suspect that a lot of the people who source from the bins, my reseller friend said it perfectly. They said, "Here's what happens: people don't have a lot of capital to get started." And they realize the items at the bins are very cheap, which they are, right? They're very cheap, no doubt about it. And they can make a little money from them, which you can, no doubt about it. But then they never progress away from that to anything that makes more dollars or is makes higher profit, um, which is fine. But it it ends up become it ends up burning out a lot of people. I suspect. I suspect. I can't prove that. So. Um, uh, so somebody said we charge shipping. Well, we know which seller you weren't looking at. There's a lot of people who do this model, Beth. I, I mean, I don't think it is really that big a thing uh, that, or it's that unusual that a lot of people do it. Um, Kelly, the sock queen. <laughs> I love that title so much, the eBay sock queen. I'm a quick nickel versus slow dime seller. Buy cheap, sell cheap, move a lot. Yeah, I mean, and for sure, Kelly, it's it's a model that if you – you know, if you had the efficiencies to do it, and like I said in the show the other day, we got very efficient at the jeans part, but I realized that like to scale it was going to be so much energy and time to put into it. It just didn't make sense. I just, I just couldn't justify it um, versus other, because remember guys, when you're saying yes to something, right, you're saying no to other things. And I'm like, there's better things out there. I feel like I know there are. And so I just couldn't keep going that way. DJ tried the bins, didn't like it. It's not for everyone. Definitely not for me. I'll stick with my regular. Yeah. I mean, and it's not for everybody. Brian asked, who are you talking about? Might be people, might be nice to let people know if you're going to base content on them, show your work. Ha ha. <laughs> um, I'm not going to say that, Brian. Because here, here's the problem. Yeah, I'm drinking water just out of the jug. This is what I do when Karin's not here. I go nuts. Um, I'm not going to say who it was specifically because it doesn't really matter. Um, you can you can look up other other people who source that way and, and do your own work, you know. And um, 
because then it becomes more about that person and one-offs and they, and it becomes personal. And I don't want to go down that road with anybody. And it's not like an indictment of them. It's, or as a person or even as a seller, I just think when you look at the numbers of it, it, it's a lot of work for not a lot of money on the back end. But trick to bins, you have to jump in the middle of the bin, grab middle of pile, lift high and flip. That's where the Ferragamo tie I found was. <laughs> ah, Krillin, I did not see your last bins haul video. No $10 items. Okay, and that's fair, Krillin. I mean, look, this person had items that sold for a higher amount too. I'm just telling you of the hundreds of items they sold, the average, the middle, and I just took you know, the pages of solds and went kind of in the middle and looked at all the ones sort of right around in the middle and they were at 10 bucks. So, you know, we all need to work smarter, not necessarily harder. I'd burn out. Yeah, that's the problem. Uh, Kelly throws away items, redonates in. <laughs> so cut down the foul balls. Love the comparison. Yeah. <sighs> I don't know. Maybe they're not even a, I was going to say they're not even a foul ball. They're a walk, but that's not it. A walk's a pretty good thing to get because then you become a base runner. And I don't feel like it's even that valuable. I feel like it's like, I don't know. You know what it's more like? You hit a long fly ball to center field and it was caught. It's like, well, you almost hit a home run, but or you almost got a base hit, but you, um, you just didn't quite get one. Um, I don't know. Let's get off the baseball comparisons. Uh, <clears throat> oh, here's it. We'll do a basketball comparison. You're hitting two point buckets all day long, or you know, selling stuff from the bins. But your opponent is hitting three point shots. They only got to hit half as many to hit to make the same amount as you do. There's your comparison. Um, let's see. Uh, the bins are dirty and yucky. Where do you think you find most of your stock? Um, uh, different different places right now, Craig. We're sourcing a lot more from new, um, new new stores like you know the Rosses, Marshalls, TJ Maxx's, and also in our consignment business too. Mike says, "What's up, Pittsburgh?" Mike says, "Demonizing the bins is what I want because I want you to all stay away. They're a gold mine for all types of items. Yeah, they're a gold mine. But there's an awful lot of pyrite in there too, Mike. <laughs> there's an awful lot of fool's gold that you spend an awful lot of time digging through and dealing with." Um, Drinking water out of the jug. I know. I'm so crazy. Uh, yard sale season is coming. Kelly says, yep, you are right. Can't wait for that. I'm, I'm actually going to hit some yard sales this year just for fun. Uh, it's like the ball hit you in the head. Mm, that might be a good analogy as well. Or a bunt. You barely get on base. Mm, yeah, and sometimes you get thrown out at first with the bunt. Um, or fielder's choice, right? Sadie, what's up, Mr. Sadie? Says, I like $30 up items with at least a 3x ROI. Most are like 5 to 10. Higher dollar items in general can move slower, so bigger inventory is best with my model. Yeah. I mean, bigger inventory is great if you have the time and the energy and the capital to build it and sustain it and, and deal with it. Um, and you can turn enough of it. So it's always like, you know, that, that, that special... I don't know. Let's say the special sauce. It's not the special sauce. It's just that ability to sort of, you know, keep maintaining um, your sell through and so on. And it's hard. Like it's very difficult. It's not easy to sort of figure out how much money to keep spending each month versus how much is going to sell versus how much is going to be profit versus how much, if you're pulling money out for this business, that brings into factor a whole nother equation. Like if you can just keep putting the money you sell, like you sell something and you get the, the proceeds and you can just keep putting that back in the business, you can grow very, very quickly. But if you're doing this full time and you get to pull out salary, that's another set of equations altogether. That's not easy to figure out. Can't do hockey, DJ, a hockey comparison. I just don't know enough about the game. Um, but I did go to a fight one time and a hockey game broke out. Sorry, that's all I got. Uh, let's see. You're extreme. I'm doing great, sir. Um, Craig says, I don't trust the bins myself. Small thrift stores have wonderful return on investments if you know what to look for. Yeah, I mean, a lot of stuff that ends up at the bins was in a thrift store, and usually they're more organized. I mean, it's not even just the profit model. It's like we said on the show the other day. It's the disorganization, the time to look through. I, I really, I bet you 
See, now I'm going to make a bet. I'm not going to be able to back this up because I'm not going to go do it. But this would be fun. It'd be fun to go to the bins and pick 50 items at random like I told you guys on Friday. Don't even look at them. Just pick the first 50 items I come to at a table and see how well I do. And I bet you I would do as well. I bet you I would do for the time spent, if you could figure that out, just as well as somebody who stays there for a while looking through them. Maybe we have a challenge going here. Maybe we'll figure out a challenge to do. I don't know. I don't know how we'll do it, but there's there's a great idea. But I think I could. I think I could do just as well picking 50 random items as the typical reseller goes in there and sorts through everything for the time spent. That's the key there. I'm not saying you can't find home runs there because you can. If you go in there and spend 10 hours there, of course you're going to find some great stuff. But you're going to be there 10 hours. Like your hourly rate's dropping every second you're there. So there's my uh, – there's my goal. Mike says I wouldn't. I guarantee it. Try it, Mike. You're a good a good one to try it because you do a lot of bin sourcing. Um, I think some sellers don't do the math and have no idea if they're making money. Yeah, that's true, Kelly. And the math, the math on making money when you're full time versus part time versus a hobby is quite different between those three. And you're absolutely right. And a lot of us we run into this. Oh, I did five thousand sales. I did two thousand sales. I did ten thousand sales. It's like, but what did you spend in time and capital to generate that? You know, that's the question. Um, so anyway, uh, Deb, hi, Prof, just woke from a nap. Well, welcome. Welcome to being awake, Deb. Here's the world. <laughs> Good to see you. <laughs> Everyone needs Prof spreadsheet. Yeah, I mean, the spreadsheet's great, but even there, if you don't use it or use a spreadsheet, if you don't have mine, use something, you know, figure out if you're making any money or not. And it's tricky. It's tricky to make money in this business at a sustainable level um, with with a lot of our models, not just the Ben's model, but a lot of models, you know, run into that challenge. It's tricky if you're trying to build a full time um, guarantee or a full time salary. Ben's are gross. I always find pea stained pants. Yeah, but you can find those anywhere. I mean, those I mean, that's true, but you could find those anywhere. You could find those in a thrift store. I mean, that's not that's not entirely uncommon. But um, I don't think that's necessarily anything specifically just about the bins. Uh, the trick is going when they put out the new bins. If you're going the rest of the time, you're looking through sorted items. Yeah, Aaron, here's my challenge to that. And we've talked about this before on the show with the bins in general. Okay, so they don't have this infinite supply in the back room, right? So when they, let's like in our bins, for instance, they have these big rolling tables and they usually pull like four of them off and bring out four. Well, those four that are coming in are not necessarily new items. They're not. Sometimes they're rehashing what was on other items and putting them back out on those four items because otherwise they would have to have just this ridiculous supply in the back and to only put stuff out one time really wouldn't maximize their, their time to even deal with that item. It makes more sense to kind of, Maybe throw a few more new items on. It's not like they have just this inexhaustible supply of items. So they are recirculating some of those items. I have seen them come back out with the same item. Like it'll be something unusual that didn't sell. And then I'll come back like a week later sometimes it's the same item. Now, I can't speak to what they're doing in every bins. But I know here in, in Charlotte, there are we have an outlet store. And they do recycle some of the materials. Is it all recycled? Probably not. But some of it is. So... You're not really seeing anything that different if you've kind of quote unquote gone through it all. But their idea is it's kind of like the idea in, in merchandising in a store where you move stuff from this section and put it over here because people shop in patterns and the same people who saw it over here won't necessarily see it over there and vice versa. So you're hoping that somebody new will see it that wants it and buys it. Um, and plus they bring out new tables to generate excitement in the bins. Oh, look, it's a bunch of new stuff. It's not necessarily all new stuff. Let's let's be real here. So, but they're trying to get you to believe that. So, you know, they'll generate excitement and people will start going through and pulling it out. So, uh, let's see. Uh, what percentage of your business do you think will be consignment in the 50s? Do you mean like an average selling price of the 50s, JR? Um, that's kind of my threshold to try to start to sell something on eBay is $50 and up. But we will sell stuff locally that will go for less than that potentially. The idea is to move everything out 
as it comes into consignment and hopefully not send anything back to consigner unless they really want it. Um, and often they don't. So the idea is to, is to move it all. Um, so some of it will be lower than that. But I, right now, the average selling price of our consignment items, I'd have to look and see for this month. But it's, it's up near around about 70 or so. Um, so it's, it's been pretty good. Uh, yeah, so some, uh, let's see. <clears throat> Eddie says, I started three years ago. I've been trying to grow. I'm realizing I need a higher dollar amount to make more money. Eddie, I'm with you. You and I are in the same boat. Like, cause I started kind of full time-ish around that same time. I was selling some before that too, but, um, yeah, I, I agree with you. Like, I mean, it's, it's difficult. It's difficult to make a, a large salary, even a medium salary, however you want to find that. And that depends on, you know, lots of factors selling, you know, pre-owned clothing items, unless you can scale your business up with employees or, you know, outsource your, your listing, your photographs, whatever, get items in, in bulk that you just cannot, if you're going to do it all yourself, you just run into a time problem. I mean, you can only source so many items. You can only list so many items and photos, so many items in a day, in a week, in a month, in a year. Um, that's just, it's a finite amount. Like you maybe don't know the amount, but it's finite, right? It's not like you're just an infinite supply of listings and photos. I mean, so you run into that at some point, you hit that wall and you may or may not be at your, your goal. So and if you're not, you need to adjust your, your model. Uh, let's see. In the future, percentage, um, JR says about the average selling price. Uh, that's a great question, JR. I, I feel like, you know, there are some huge consigners on eBay. And some of them sell like luxury items that have, you know, uh, massive prices. And they take a lower and lower percentage, which makes sense. But... I don't know if I'd ever want to go quite down that route, but I think that, um, you know, I definitely can see like a 70 or 80 or a dollar average sale price being um, pretty standard for consigners, at least in the new future and the near future. And so I think that's kind of the number that will land around at some point here, maybe not right away, but we will. Um, it could be a little lower than that. And it could also be a little higher because we do get these one offs that are huge numbers from time to time and blow up that average. Um, but, um, you know, those are one-offs, so you're not going to get a lot of them. But a more steady number might be around 70, 75 bucks, somewhere in there. Uh, let's see. Uh, and Mike's not doing any more shows. All right, well, you heard it here first. Maybe not here first, but you heard it here. <laughs> Uh, Sadie, ah, oh, man, that's, uh, that's pretty good, Sadie. So Mr. Sadie said, and you'll be able to see this in the chat. My math tells me that knowledge plus work ethic plus working smart equals more money. I used to grab everything I could make a buck on. I walk past small profits all day now just because there's a better way. There you have it. Sadie said it. That's, you're all over it. What do you mean consigners? Consigners are people who send you an item or give you an item to sell on consignment for them. And consignment, if you don't know that model, it's just simply they retain ownership of the item, but you as the consignee actually have the item in your possession to try to sell for them. And if it sells, you get a percentage of the sales price um, as a consignment fee and they get the rest of the fee. They get the rest of the sales proceeds minus any selling costs and fees and things like that. So that's, um, that's what it is. Eddie says, Prof, are you moving away from selling jeans? <sighs> yes, with a caveat. Um, I definitely am moving away from the pre-owned jean market right now only because with the space that we have here, even though right now we have enough space, we won't. Um, but I will need this space for more consignment items and other new items that we are sourcing and getting from our consigners. But 
I'm definitely trying to push up my average selling price and pre-owned jeans. It's very difficult to do that in to the numbers that, you know, we're kind of looking to hit. I would say that in the right circumstance, I would absolutely sell new jeans and I still look for those um, new with tags, brand new that are discounted or, you know, at a thrift store or Play-Dohs or what have you. But I'm not going to be selling in bulk the pre-owned jeans like we were. And I've, I've said that before. This is nothing new. Um, it's just we are actually discounting a lot of our older jeans, trying to move them out um, just to free up some capital from those that have been setting for a while and just, you know, move through them. So there you go. Now, and there's nothing wrong with selling jeans. Don't get me wrong. It's not that. This this goes back to, and I know there's people out there that will hear that, and some people will say, oh, well, Prof just said it's wrong to sell jeans. No, that is not what I said. What I said was our model is changing. That doesn't change the fact that selling pre-owned jeans on eBay is a bread and butter kind of type of reselling that is perfectly acceptable for lots of models. So I just want to make that very clear. Uh, the VOT, value of your time. Yes. Uh, did you ever hear of Lux Swap Consignment? They just sold a shirt for me that did 280 bucks at auction. Uh, by the way, I found it Ben's. It's great, Rob. I mean, look, th here's the thing. I mean, you are going, I have never said you're not going to find home run one-offs at the Ben's. You will. You will also find those at yard sales. You will also find those at state sales. You will also find those at thrift shops. You will find those at lots of places. My contest, what I'm contesting is the buying bins items for low dollar amounts to sell for relatively low dollar amounts. That model is not a good model for new eBay sellers Spe specifically, even though a lot of times it's the model that is preached. Oh, go to the bins and buy 50 things and I don't think it's a good model for all the reasons I laid out in the Friday bin. If can you go and find those home runs there? Yes, but I would rather look through a circle rack of shirts, a T rack of jeans, than to go dig through a big heaping mound of clothes on a table in the bins. I would. I mean, I think that's much simpler. I think it's easier. I think you can hit more stores in less time, and I think you're more likely to find it as well. So. If, if you had to pay $5 for that shirt and instead of $1 or that you probably paid the bins, I mean, would it really matter in the long run? And if you could find it 10 times easier, I would do it at the, the thrift store, you know? So that that's my contention. Not that you can't find home runs there. Of course you can. Are you getting a good response to consignment service or you want to go straight consignment given the choice? Probably not straight consignment. Are you having to turn down a lot? No, nothing yet. Um, so it's a little different model, which we're still kind of fleshing out. Deb, thanks so much for the super chat. Really appreciate it. Um, what's the five mean? I'm not sure what that means, but I think you said jeans suck, Mr. Sadie. Sadie putting words in my mouth. Thanks. I appreciate that. <laughs> Oh, I'm going to so two outer you one day, Mr. Sadie. And I know you know what that means. Um, <laughs> just kidding, my friend. Um, too tall says I've been picking up some large jeans that have a higher resale value. Sure. Uh, let's see. Mike says jeans are terrible. Stay away because he likes selling jeans. Yep. We see what you're doing here, Mike. We see your game plan. <laughs> There's a lot of competition selling used jeans. The margin isn't there. Um, Adam, well, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's a slog like anything else, Adam. You're gonna have to take some time to educate yourself if you want to find the home run type jeans. I mean, just like anything else, like you're not, could you walk in there and find them? Of course, but you know, you're gonna have to look through hundreds and hundreds of jeans to find the 10 or 20, you know, really good ones. Um, and, and or if that many, so that, but that's like anything else, like you're not gonna walk in there you know, and just the first pair you pick up usually is going to be amazing. I mean, it could happen, but it's just not very likely. Uh, if your bins smell like urine, I would call corporate. Probably not a bad idea. Uh, beanie babies. Yeah, we had some beanie babies the other day that people had listed for like $300, but none of them had sold. They were supposed to have errors on the tags. I think they were just being optimistic. Uh Happy Monday, Prof. Really enjoying this episode. Thank you, Rianne. I appreciate that. Uh, thanks for the video. I appreciate the info. Yeah. Do you and Karin still have a new business partner? 
As of right now, we do not. Um, that could change in the future, but at the moment we do not. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that, that kind of is like behind the scenes stuff and so on. But, you know, it's what happens. So we kind of have a different partner in a weird way. Um, but I'll let her explain that at some point. Um, you could sell pre-owned jeans in bulk to resale as you got such a trustable experience. Yeah, I mean, you could, I mean, I could, but I don't know. As long as the bad beat pot for about a 100K progressive, I'll take second. <laughs> it's funny you say that, Sadie. I was at a table at a casino where I saw um, a straight flush get ripper rivered to get beat, um, which would have qualified. But that casino did not have a bad beat jackpot. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. This poor kid flops a straight flush and the guy hits river, river and um, to hit, to come to his two cards that, you know, would have played. It was crazy. Uh, uh, the profit was my first super chat. The five was nothing. Gotcha. <laughs> All right. Well, that's cool. And by the way, guys, uh, one quick note. I did jump on Poshmark last night. You heard it here first. Um, so I have not listed anything there yet. I'm still figuring out the platform. You can find me at prof sales on Poshmark. I guess I should put that in my stuff here at some point. Not sure how I'm going to work it out yet, how I'm going to use it yet, what I'm going to put on there, but I'm definitely interested in it and at least exploring it with some listings. Um, so we'll see how that goes, but check it out. You can find me on Poshmark at prof sales. I have nothing in my closet. I think that's the right term, right? as of yet, but I am there. So if you want to uh, come hang out and uh, there you go. Um, apparently I have a bunch of followers all of a sudden that I don't even know how I have. I'm like, how do these people even know? I don't even know who they were, but anyway, might be a Poshmark thing. So, all right guys, look, that's going to do it for today. Thanks for watching. Um, check out the link below or the description below for all kinds of helpful links. And please hit the like button before we leave here. If you like this video or if you didn't like it, you can hit the dislike button. Either way, but I hope you guys have a great rest of your Monday. And um, I will see you guys hopefully with Karin back on Wednesday. So take care. Have a great rest of your Monday. And as always, this is Prof Sales saying good sales to you.